Good evening. I'm Peggy Fry, the Interim University Librarian, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening for the annual Tannis Family Endowed Lecture. Peter J. Tannis, Georgetown College Class of 1960, and a member of the Georgetown University Library Board, established the lecture fund in 2010 in honor of Lounger Library's 40th anniversary. We are very grateful to Mr. Tannis for that gift, which allows us to present this timely program and we thank him for serving as the moderator this evening. I'm pleased to introduce to you Sarah Gannam. Sarah is the Washington, D.C.-based CNN correspondent who covers a wide range of stories and investigations, both on television and for CNN.com. Prior to joining CNN in 2012, Sarah worked for the Patriot News in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania where she broke the groundbreaking story of the grand jury investigation into Jerry Sandusky, the former defensive coordinator for the Penn State University football program. Just turn off the back. <laughs> the <case. laughs> I was wondering. <laughs> Sarah is an investigative performing, help, investigative reporting, sorry, um, helped bring to light Sandusky's abuse of children, as well as implicating Joe Paterno, the head coach, for failing to act. In April 2012, Sarah became one of the youngest people to win a Pulitzer Prize for this work. Sarah is also the recipient of the prestigious George Polk Award in Journalism, the Sydney Award for Socially Conscious Journalism, and won the Sigma Delta Chi Award from the Society of Professional Journalists. Sarah received the Philip Habib Award for Distinguished Public Service by the American Task Force for Lebanon. She's been recognized by the Associated Press Managing Editors Association for her work with student journalists, teaching college-level journaliz journalism courses, and speaking to students interested in the profession. Sarah has a degree in journalism from Penn State University and was a 2015 fellow in the Journalist Law School program at Loyola Law School in Los Angeles. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Gannon and Peter Tim. Hi everyone, can you hear us okay? Yeah. Yes. Everybody can? Okay. Project. We can do this without mics. <laughs> this is, I'm not used to, I usually have a mic and it's someone in my ear. <laughs> They have nothing. No one's going to tell me when to stop. It's not yeah. good for you. I'll tell if you. anybody can hear, just just give us a signal and we'll try to be a little louder. So, actually, at Sarah's suggestion, we decided to use uh, this format, which we'll do to get all the stories out of Sarah. And there will be a Q&A after that, so uh, uh, please start thinking about all the interesting things you're going to ask her. Peter was gonna, he gave me a list of all, I want you to tell all these stories. I said, why don't you just sit next to me and, hear me and say, now it's time to tell this story. He gave us all the questions. No, I know he did. All right, Sarah, let's get started. Okay. Um, before, I mean, you have amazing accomplishments at a very young age. And uh, let's start from the beginning. Tell us a little bit about growing up, where you grew up. Oh my up, gosh, that and take, take me through to your interest in journalism and your degree in journalism? Well, I am a Michigander. I was born in Livonia, Michigan. I lived there until I was seven, and then moved to Florida, where I grew up. So at heart, I'm really a Florida girl. I see other Florida people in the audience are getting very excited. Yes. I don't do well in the winter. This four nor'easter thing is like, no go for me. Um, yeah, terrible. And uh, and I went to Penn State because I wanted. I knew I wanted to be a journalist. My my mom, when I was uh, about 14, 15 years old, was super annoying at home. She cut out an ad in our local newspaper, the Sun Sentinel, just to give me some like something to do. They had a, a teen journalism program and she put it on my bed and she was like you need somewhere to be outside of this house because we were going to kill each other and, um, <laughs> and so she drove me and I you know I, I kind of just like became a journalist I fell in love with it I absolutely could not think about doing anything else after that moment where I started working at the Sun Sentinel and um, I at 15 had my first bylines so I never looked back. I knew I wanted to do this for, you know, in college, I wanted to study this and, and have, make a career out of it. So I started picking schools with journalism programs, but Penn State was like, 
I opened up the Princeton Review, which this was before the internet was what the internet is today. We still had the big book when I was looking at colleges, and you had to read like the limited number of, inf of detail that they would give you in this book that you bought at the library at Barnes & Noble or somewhere. And um, I was just flipping through, like, how far away can I go? And, <laughs> and there was Penn State, <laughs> and it said journalism in their listed number of degrees. <laughs> and my dad went to Penn for grad school, which is not Penn State, but um, he didn't realize that they weren't in the same town. <laughs> so he was like, my mom said, I am not taking her to see another school. She's going to a Florida school. Florida tuition is free for kids, in-state. That's it. I paid the deposit for housing. She's going to UCF, which is Central Florida. And I was like, I'm not going to college because I'm not going there. <laughs> so my dad was like, OK. He took me up to, to we went to Philadelphia, where Penn State is not. And <laughs> Philadelphia. And then he's like, OK, let's drive over to State College. Three hours later, I thought we were going to die because it's like a windy, mountainous, one-way road to get there. And I'm from flat Florida, so there's nothing like that, you know, where I grew up. And I thought, my dad's going to drive right up the cliff, and it's the end of my life. <laughs> and we got there, and it was this beautiful campus. And it was a March day. It was like 65 degrees. Everyone else was wearing, you know, flip-flops and shorts because they were so excited that the sun was out after <laughs> hibernation. And my dad and I were in Uggs and coats. <laughs> and it was freezing. <laughs> I thought that was winter, though. And, um, but I fell in love with it because they had a daily student newspaper. And I walked into their newsroom, and it smelled like ink. And I was just like, this is it. I have to go here. And so um, my dad called my mom, and he was like, OK, you know, this is like the thing. She has to go here. This is the one. So they ended up letting me go, and then close to murdered me when my sister followed, so they had to pay tuition <laughs> twice. <laughs> but uh, um, my dad actually, my dad pointed out as we were leaving, he looked at a fire hydrant and he said, you Florida folks will appreciate this, he said, do you know what the stick is on the top of a fire hydrant? I said, no. He goes, that's so they can find the fire hydrant when it snows. And I was like, oh my god, <laughs> I had no idea what was coming. Because <laughs> this place is in a valley in the mountains in central Pennsylvania. So that's how I ended up at Penn State. Great. No, <laughs> yeah. And uh, I'll ask you later about your career as a stand-up comic, which I just <laughs> uh, Let's cut to the chase. Yes. The story that won you the Pulitzer Prize. How did all that? How did the story happen? How, how did it come that you were the person who got the story? Well, I was, so I went, I went to Penn State. I went to the student daily paper. And um, quickly after, shortly after I began in school, the real, what I would say, trouble with the newspaper industry began, where they realized they were losing revenue, ad revenue, because of the internet, weren't quite sure how to deal with that situation, and they were laying off people like crazy. And so all of, when I was a freshman and sophomore, all of my um, newspaper friends who were seniors were not getting jobs. And here I am, I know that, you know, I begged and pleaded to go to this really expensive school, and I can't graduate without a job. Like, that was, I knew that was a no-go. So I applied for a part-time job with the local paper, it was a um, nighttime crime reporting gig. And I loved that, though. I was so excited. I, uh, I applied for the job, and I got, I got the job, which is actually, looking back on it, kind of shocking. I was 19 years old. I don't think they knew how old I was. And, um, and I just dove right in. It was supposed to be you know 20 hours a week, uh, several you know months in. Corporate came down and yelled at my boss because I was sometimes clocking like 45, 50 hours a week. I just loved it. It was supposed to be 2 to 10. My boss realized I was not working 2 to 10 because, you know, court's like during the day, so I would come in way earlier. And she would circle around my desk and be like, go to class, you know? <laughs> and it really got to the point where the big boss of the paper came to me and said, you don't graduate. Like, can't stay here and so I had to like start going to class mm -hmm. but I loved it I loved covering you know these trials I could sit in court for hours and I just I loved it I had a police scanner 
uh, in our house. <laughs> I lived with two other, you know, poor college, recent, you know, like, you know, in the mid twenties kids who worked at the newspaper. One was a photographer, and the other one covered Penn State. And you know, we had very little money, but we would run out in the middle of the night with a police scanner and chase crime stories and fight over who would get to write it. So, um, so I, I had. I was, long story short, I lived there and I worked there and I had for a long time. I did graduate by the skin of my teeth and um, they made me a full-time reporter and, um, and I was the crime reporter. So it was my job to keep tabs on investigations and trials and arrests and, and so I had good sources in that but town. How, how did you come upon this story that nobody else seemed to know about? Well, I had really good sources, and I would call, probably my last round of calls would be around like 8, 9 o'clock at night to see what's going on, you know, like did, did anything major happen today. And one day during that round of calls, someone said, you know, there's a story coming. Someone has accused Jerry Sandusky of molesting a little boy who was sleeping over at his house. Now, to be honest with you, Jerry Sandusky was... 10 years removed from the school at that time. He had retired 10 years prior. So I was like a kid when he was there. I didn't, I'm not from Pennsylvania. I didn't know who he was. I had to Google him really quick. I was like, Jerry Zandowski. But he was a charity owner, so I knew that if someone who had a children's charity was accused of molesting a child, it was going to turn into a story. And so I kind of just kept my ear to the ground after that. When did it explode as everybody here knows the story, that was especially about the Turner. When did it explode? So much later. So um, more than two years after that phone call did you all hear about Jerry Sandusky. I mean, in the interim, people tried to kill the investigation. There was, you know, some, some people told me, never mind, that's not true, don't look there anymore. He had to retire from his charity, which he started, we started just hearing these rumblings, right? And like things that when your reporter brain is like, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, why would he retire, but then he, you know, but he's also supposedly spent, you know, he's supposedly ill, but he's not, like nobody could get their story straight at the charity for why he was gone. And we just started to hear things. Um, I got another job at a bigger newspaper and the very first day, I said to them, like, we should pursue this, and they said, yeah, we should, and they gave me something that, it's a gift that is very rare in this business, they gave me the time to just go do it, like, just go figure it out, don't worry about anything else for a little bit, just go knock on as many doors and talk to as many people as you can until you get the story, and it was only about eight, eight maybe 12 weeks. Um, felt like a lifetime, <laughs> but it was, um, you know, a collaborative process with my editors, and, and we finally ended up writing a story that detailed two allegations that were being investigated against him. But that's not even when you heard about it. You heard about it nine months after that, when he was finally arrested. And the um, prosecutors and the grand jury in this case did something that really changed, I think, the way that the public viewed this case and future cases. They wrote a very concise and very detailed and graphic 18-page presentment that wasn't all legal jargon and, you know, it was a narrative. It was like a story. They wrote you a story and they posted it publicly on the internet and everybody could go in 18 pages, 20 minutes, they could read what he was accused of. And I think that's really what blew this up because everybody was reading it, and everybody would then talk to their kids about it, or their spouse, or their friends, and it really, that's what sparked the conversation. But you're still writing about it at this point, right? Oh yeah, well at this point, I mean, this is my entire life at this point now, yeah, yeah because he, he was, you know, he was being arrested, and everyone who didn't really see it coming was looking for someone to explain to them what had been going on for two years. And so that's how I sort of got thrust into the national spotlight. Well, Sandusky's in jail, of course. Yes. Now you switch to the legend, Joe Paterno, one of the most legendary football coaches in history. And I believe this is still probably a controversy at Penn State. I know after he died, his, his 
life-size statue was removed from the campus. Um, how did that perpetuate the story and what happened next? Yeah, that's interesting. I think if you had removed Joe Paterno from the equation, the story probably wouldn't have been as big as it is because he was the heart and soul of Penn State and really encapsulated their whole identity. And so him being a part of the mix really brought the eyeballs and the attention from the national press. Um, but also, he died within two months of the, of the arrest. And with a lot of unanswered questions about his involvement, what happened is this great divide of people who could not just sort of accept a gray area and they had to f you know, fill in the blanks and fall into one side. And so they either fell into the camp of he must not have known anything or they fell into the camp of he had to know everything. And it's hard for most people I think to just accept that he died and <laughs> he died before you could really confront him with a lot of evidence. And so it's created a debate that has not died. In fact, I think it's, it's in Pennsylvania or among the fan base of Penn State, it's really grown because people, I think, you know, human nature is to crave for like the facts, the answers, just tell me, yes, did he know or no, did he not? What's the right and wrong, you know? And there, that doesn't exist in this Where case. Where do you and come down? Where do you come down? Well, I come down on the side of the journalism on this one, right? Like, on, like all of these things. I, I truly believe what I just said. I think that you know we don't know. I can't. I can't. So you don't, say you're not on either side. I mean, based on all your reporting, wouldn't you have an inkling of who's right and who's wrong here? But what is right and wrong? Like, so the question he is, knew or he didn't know. did he know or did he not know? That's no. the question, right? So. You could make the argument very easily that he knew a lot of what was going on at that school. Um, but he was more than 80 years old. This pedophilia was not something that we talked of, that he would have talked about in his youth the same way that we're all talking about it right now. Because prior to the Catholic Church scandal, nobody talked about this mm -hmm. at all, especially men and boys. Maybe men and girls. Right, but not boys. I mean, that was not something that was ever discussed. Um, so it's kind of context, right? It's not all just. Facts. It's still a controversy on campus, isn't it? Absolutely, because there are people who say, you know, I told him, and there are people who say that you know everyone has has attacked him because it generates money and lawsuits and attention, and and those are not things that you can judge truth or fact, those are opinion things, right? So you can't, you can't, how, how do you say to a victim on one hand, you're probably lying because you don't have evidence, because there are never, there's never evidence in these cases, yeah. and how do you say to, to someone who's defending him, there's absolute evidence? There isn't, so and It's amazing what area. your reporting led to, not only this with the most legendary coach in football, but didn't the didn't the president of Penn State have to resign? Oh well, he's in. He went. He went to jail. I know. They're, and they're, they're all. They're all. I mean, imagine, to, imagine. Okay, yeah. The president of Penn the president, State. President, the athletic director, and the vice president when were all jail? sentenced to to jail for very short sentences. Yeah. But, My um, and yeah. So <laughs> now, as a result of all your exploits. Um, now that wasn't me, Peter. Let's be clear. That was the victims. <laughs> Those were uh, exploits was probably the wrong word. Uh, no, no, no. I meant it wasn't but, my. It wasn't my doing that they went to jail or, or, or sentenced to jail. They haven't. Some of them have. Two of them have gone, but one of them is fighting it. But um, you know, there were there were ten victims in that in the grand jury report. So yeah, yeah. I mean that. My point they is played that, a big role. Uh, they didn't give you the Pulitzer Prize for nothing. Uh, you are the one who broke this story, and it, because of you, these people went to jail, and this story, this sordid, sordid story, was uncovered. And I mean, I mean, at least that's the way I look at it. And now, interestingly enough, I wonder how many people know this. Uh, HBO has a movie coming out in a couple of weeks called Paterno. And Al Pacino is playing Paterno. Who's playing Saragana? 
So her name is Riley Keough. She's Elvis's granddaughter. <laughs> She's very pretty, which was all I can Because <laughs> I felt like it could go either way. And you never know how people really see her. Just kidding. Right, That's does, a little bit of a joke. But <laughs> Does, uh, does Riley do a good Saragana? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I it's wait. really hard. It's hard to be. I, I have a new appreciation for the people who I interview, that's for sure, because it's weird to watch yourself be portrayed by someone else. Uh, most of us have never had that experience. It's really <laughs> odd. I actually, you know, I wish that that, 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 was not, that was not the case for me. I mean, it's very kind of, you have to remind yourself to, like, be calm about it, you know, like it, because it, you can get like, that's not what happened, you know, <laughs> it's like, wait a second, calm down, it's a movie, you know, <laughs> take a beat. And the day they invited me up to the, the uh, filming <coughs> of it one day, switch. thank you, it was up in the Bronx, so I, I drove up from the city, and it was, the, they were filming the day of Joe Paterno's firing. He was inside of his home in State College and uh, gets the phone call that he's fired and the students are on his lawn chanting and screaming. And, and um, I walked up to this set this, of his house and I got out of the car and had a panic attack because I was like, I've been here before in real life. Oh, like this sorry. was a day in my life and I was on his lawn with these students and the, you know he was being fired and now it, here I am again, like I was in some bizarre time machine that put me back in this place. So it was a very interesting experience. Uh, and did you interact with uh, the, not only Riley, of course you've interacted, did you interact with Al Pacino? Just a little bit. I told him that I, I thought he did, he, he studied pretty well. He, got, he definitely nailed the cadence and the voice and just the way that Paterno would present himself. Yeah, it's funny because some of the early critics and reviews of the movie said that he, it, it's scary how much he, yeah. you know, he, he uh, portrays accurately uh, Joe Paterno. He wanted this part. Back when I was still living in Pennsylvania, he put out a press release to kind of everyone's surprise <laughs> without a, an actual, like, production company saying, I'm going to play Joe Paterno. <laughs> he wanted to be, you know, to be this part. And um, and so I don't think he, you know, he didn't take it lightly. He, he's been studying for six years, I think. So <laughs> he did. And he told me he, he would listen in, in his, his uh, earbuds. He would just listen to Paterno at his press conferences. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, something I was very familiar with because I used to yeah. go to those and cover them. And and so, you know, he did, he did well. Wow. Uh, how, do, how does all this relate to the subsequent uh, Me Too movement, do you think? Well, I actually think that the momentum for that really started e way, way even before Sandusky. But with the Catholic Church, I'm sure you're all familiar oh, with yeah. the other movie that portrays journalism. Spotlight. Spotlight. And I've talked to that reporter from Boston um, a little bit about this, that I think that that was the beginning of the opening of the floodgates. <laughs> They're different stories, clearly. Um, you know, the, the uh, child abuse stories are different from the Me Too movement, but what really links them is that these were topics that were forbidden, you know? Like, we weren't, as women, supposed to talk about these things. Or even if we were supposed to talk, we were allowed to talk about them, we didn't because they were just accepted as part of what our workday was going to look like or what our life looked like, right? So, and it was just like, okay, you know, move forward. This is something I, I have to deal with. And I think in a lot of ways, that same sort of like acceptance of that's what the world is, is where, you know, the way that we viewed some of these crimes against children that we didn't want to talk about them because it was so uncomfortable and so awkward. You just put it somewhere else. You, you know, you see a pedophile on TV, like, that's not any of my friends. That's never going to happen to my kid. Not my kid's coach. Not my kid's teacher. Not my kid's whatever, fill in the blank. And so you never talk to your kids about it because it was really uncomfortable. 
And starting with the Catholic priest scandal, and then especially when it became coaches and you know teachers who were having interactions with kids, I think parents started to say, we do have to talk about this. And I think, you know, women drag those conversations more than men, and women began to, to say, like, hey, we should be talking about all of this stuff. In between Sandusky and Me Too, you had the, um, the uh, college uh, sexual assault wave of... Uh, they didn't get the kind of publicity. You they did. I think that you, you, you know, you didn't pay attention because it wasn't me. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it, they did. You know, there were... There were <laughs> my adopted father um, there was absolutely a wave between you know, 2012 and 2015 16 yeah. Yeah. of movement on college campuses with women you know carrying mattresses around and, and speaking up and there were documentaries being made and it was a student driven um, force to talk about sexual assault on campus and I think that that's sort of the genesis of it you know you went from all the way back to the early 2000s Catholic Church through Sandusky through the college campus movements and then that moved you know those those women went into the workforce and they said wait a second didn't we just have a, a four years of conversation about how this isn't okay and now I'm dealing with it at work too and then this movement came and that's sort of how I see it and, uh, you know what occurs to me Sarah you were in your early mid twenties on this extraordinarily tough and sensitive assignment. Um, did your youth help or hurt? I would think hurt. So I disagree. I actually think it helped um, in a number of ways, and one of them is that you get kind of like grizzled and sort of maybe calloused sometimes in this business, and. When you're young, before that happens, you have a different perspective uh, on things. Um, and I also think that you know, like if I put my hair up in a pony, oh, this is my CNN, Sarah. Like this is they did my hair and makeup today. But if I don't have all this makeup on and I put my hair up in a ponytail, I look like I'm 15 still. So I, you can imagine when I was 20, what I looked like. I was I would go to the doctor's office and. People would say, where's your mom? Like, <laughs> I can do this by myself. But, um, you know, you knock on someone's door, and if there's, like, a shiny-haired reporter with a microphone, they're like, you know, what do you know? People are going to slam the door. But if there's a kid, they're going to say, what's going on? And, and so I think that people were sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes more comfortable talking to me. And I did recognize that it works both ways, that in the courthouse it was harder for me to get an attorney to explain some intricacy of the law that I didn't get, because they would be like, who are you, go away, you're in my face. <laughs> but you know, you can play that both ways, and if you recognize the situation, you can, I always, you know, I would say, I'm going to use this to my advantage, so if I look young and naive, well then let me play that part and, you, and use that to get what I need, um, and so, you know, I mean, I still, we, you know, you still get it. The young folks in the room know. You still, you know, you, I think that, I haven't hit yet the turning point where people at work don't still say like, oh, you weren't born yet, but like, I was already doing this. And you have to say like, yeah, that's right, and I'll be around long after you, so like, <laughs> let's move on. You know, and you just kind of have to like own that and, and, and embrace it and then go with it. And then that's what I've always tried to do. And so I do think it, I do think it helped. Yeah. Let's, uh, before we wrap up this part and go to Q&A, uh, big picture, what are the cultural changes that are happening or are needed, both on university campuses and at large, that you see or hope to see? I have always said since this story broke that I think the biggest issue that Penn State still has not quite grasped is that they could not see past, they had their identity in one thing. That was their football team and their football coach. And they could not get past that. They couldn't let it go. They couldn't say, we made a mistake. This was not handled correctly. They couldn't, it, it's always been, not my guy, not my team, 
not us. They want, you know, someone early on in the scandal said to me, all these Penn State people are, are furious because they want to be able to go into a bar and say, my team's better than your team. And they can't do that anymore. And that's, that's a problem, I think. That's a cultural problem. I think, you know, <laughs> the way that the, the idol worship that happened and that continues to happen I think it's just very unhealthy for humanity in general. I think that it's not fair to the person who's being worshipped, you know, because they're held to this ridiculously high standard. And it's not fair to the people who have thrust all their loyalty into one person or one entity. It just doesn't make that much sense to me. And I see it over and over again. You know, after I went to CNN, I covered scandals at Notre Dame and at UNC and you know many other colleges and, and it, the constant theme of circling the wagons not my guy circling the wagons not my team nothing wrong here nothing to see and Penn State continues to to perpetuate that and so I think until that's sort of solved until we can let go of that you know of that part of you know, people just take it so personal until they can let go of that, I don't think we're going to be able to move on from things like this. Sarah, what a wonder! I mean, at your age, you're 30, right? Uh, yes, thank you for I mean, <laughs> At your age, having accomplished what you've accomplished, having won a Pulitzer Prize in Germany, about to see somebody play you on in 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 a movie, uh, I, I hesitate to think what. The next ten years are going to no, be no. That's the problem. Well, it's horrible. Don't bring it up. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're going to go to Q and A. Please join me in thanking Sarah for being here. Thank you. Thank you. It's all yours. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, Emily. You just gave me a good. What kind of um, pushback, if any, did you receive from the Penn State community while you were? investigating, um, especially because you went to Penn State, for people like, why are you betraying things like that? You know, it's interesting. I actually had mostly support at that time, back then. Um, less now. I think it's strangely changed. Um, at the time, it was, you know, everyone was sort of behind this, let's get this bad guy in jail. Now that the bad guy is in jail and the focus is more on this sort of gray area of what Paterno knew, it's, you know, a lot of shoot the messenger, a lot of it. Um, I, you know, there were obviously administration officials were not thrilled mm -hmm. with our investigation, but that's to be expected. Um, but, you know, students and professors were generally at that time supportive. There were a few, you know, there, there are always a few instances. There were, there were some, you know, mobs that you know would come out you know after us in, in our media camps and stuff like that and um, there were some there were some professors who you know said some interesting things <laughs> put it that way um, but I always say you know Penn State taught me how to do this job so yeah. questions yes sir Bye. well two semi-related questions to that but one was you said that you were said the movie being filmed, and it was like a deja vu that you had already. What was it like to be the one in the crowd who was causing the incident that you were reporting about? You know, had you not written it, there wouldn't be the crowd outside the Paterno's office. And then the second one, when about Paterno, you say it's gray because he died without being able to prove it. How did you document and justify your? reportage to your editors for the documentation and she's not just coming out of the blue why how can you how could you write it in such a way that they would believe you enough to print it okay i'll start with the first one first um at the time probably a blessing i did not realize what the thirty thousand foot view was i didn't get that this would lead to the things that it led to i um you know Someone, one of my colleagues of the newspaper said to me when, he, when Sandusky was arrested, she said, how long before you think the president of the university will resign? And I said, I don't know, maybe he'll retire at the end of the year. I mean, I was so wrong. They were all fired within 24 hours of that comment. 
Um, but I just didn't have the same perception. I also lived in that town and believed that there was no way that anyone, you know, any of these people were touchable. So, I mean, that night when he was fired, I was surprised. I was absolutely surprised. But I don't think I had the same grasp on the gravity of it that I do now. So that wasn't something that was going through my head. On the second question, um, I wasn't alone out there putting the story together by myself and presenting it as a whole package. And I've always been the kind of reporter that's very um, collaborative and communicative. Like uh, every time I get a phone with someone, I say to my editor, okay, this is, what, this is what I got. Where should we go from here? This is the piece I'm looking for. Because it helps me sort of generate ideas to get around brick walls and, and things that aren't so easily obtained. Um, so they were with me every step of the way. You know, we would, I would start the day and we would have a, a call with the editors and the, and the lawyer, and you know, I'd say, here's what I have, and they would say, okay, well, in order to print that, you need to have A, B, C, and D. And then I'd spend the day and I'd get A, B, C, and D, and then at the end of the day, they would say, okay, in order to print that, you need to have E, F, G, H, and then, and then we kept going until one day they said, you have enough. And so, you know, they were aware along the way of everything that was being gathered. But the, and the first story that I wrote was 30 people all on background. None of them were on the record except one. One of the very last people I called actually just started talking and I was like, wait, what? You know, are you actually saying this to me on the record? So there was one person on the record, 30 people, it was two cases. We had five people for every one single fact that we wrote. So basically five people, you know, per sentence, essentially. Because, you know, they were all anonymous. So we had, we had a really high standard. It was sort of looking back on it, it's amazing that, that it only took 12 weeks. Yes, go ahead, lady, young lady. Yeah. I, uh, I'm a graduate journalism student here. Um, and I actually want to focus on like investigative with a focus like in data reporting, data visualization. Um, one of the things that I've started to notice is that a lot of investigative stories take months, you know, several months to a couple of years, as you said, to um, really finish and actually publish. So how do you know when you're done? It's really hard. Like, how do you know when you're actually ready to publish? It's a fantastic question. Because as the reporter, you're so deep that you don't know when, you know, you're so deep into it. You live and breathe it every single day. And to your point, on that story, when our lawyer said, okay, you have enough, it's, let's publish, I couldn't, I was like, wait, I have one more idea, like, let's call one more person. And my editor said, look, you can every day for the next two years, you could call one more person. <laughs> like, let's publish a story, and then we'll call one more person, and tomorrow we'll publish another story. And that's something that has stuck with me, because it's really easy to just, to, you know, your editors and, and the people around you will tell you when you don't have enough, but when you do have enough, I try to remind myself, it's not the end of the road, you know? For example, my colleague Drew Griffin, um, maybe two years ago now, did the investigative series at CNN that led to the ouster of the VA secretary over all of the VA problems at the hospitals. The first story he did on that was about one, one victim at one hospital in Arizona. That wasn't the story that got the secretary fired. That story led to another story in Pittsburgh and to another story somewhere else and to multiple stories. And it was the accumulation of all of that that led to his firing. But if Drew had said, oh wait, we only have one guy, one hospital, we gotta go get 30 more guys at 30 more hospitals, who knows what would have happened, maybe nothing. And it, but one story led to somewhere else because someone saw it and said, that happened to my, my husband or my father or it happened to me. And that's how it snowballed. And so I try to remember that, but that's a really good question because I think a lot of times you, you can fall into that trap. I've, I've definitely fallen into that trap too. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. Like some of these investigative stories that take a year are really, really good. Yes, sir. Recently, uh, Trump was in Southwest Pennsylvania spouting forth to his core audience. And a lot of it was criticism of the media, especially CNN. How does it affect if even marginally when you approach administration officials and you say, I'm Sarah again of, of CNN, and they say, oh, CNN. Mm. Uh, 
Uh, you know, it's not something that I take into consideration. I don't know how they feel because I'm not in, you know, their heads. But I think I have pretty good relationships with the people that I need to have good relationships with. And, um, you know, I, that's not something I don't think about it when I ask questions. Yes, young lady, go there. You. Yes, thank you. Um, from your experience, what do you think is the link? You kind of already mentioned, but what is the link between the president or the vice president or the people that kind of knew but denied to, I don't know, fire that person from the beginning? Or why do, why do we human beings yeah, why keep do do that? silent to these stories, whether they are boys or girls? that are molested or abused sexually. What came out during the multiple investigations and you know all of the, the different reports was that there was a sense of we can handle this. You know, we don't need outsiders to deal with our personal business. This is our world and we can deal with this on our own. It was a combination of that and also like none of my business. A lot of people said, well I never saw him doing this. So well of course like, I mean, that's, pedophiles are, you know, they, they know whether they design their whole world around fooling you and tricking you because obviously they're breaking the law, right? So, of course you didn't see it. But so many people said, like, something was off. It's weird. Like, he would bring kids to dinners, like gala dinners. He would bring a kid as his date instead of his wife, you know, with his arm around them the whole night. Or just, like things that would make people, today I think would make people pick up the phone and report something like, you know, this doesn't feel right to me. But it was, I didn't, I don't know, I didn't see it. It's not my, not my business. And, and that's sort of the conversation that, that needed to change. We've got time, yes, you have like yeah. So my, I'm an undergraduate student here, and while I'm not a journalist student, I sorry to disappoint you. I no, am not a traditional <laughs> politics major with a concentration in international law. And what fascinates me about law, and I did say those two words, fascination and law, in the same sentence. So <laughs> like, no poor thing, no like poor thing for law school. But what fascinates me about law is that it confers upon you the ability to protect people through words and also the ability to fight for the truth, however unpleasant it may be. And I think journalism is similar in a lot of aspects. So I was wondering, when you were investigating the story about the sexual abuse, which is not easy to talk about even after the Me Too movement, where and how did you find the courage to continue this pursuit of truth? I, I honestly, you find it with, you find it from the people who you're talking to, right? You go into some someone's home, they invite you, a stranger, into their home, let you sit on their couch, and they pour out their heart. Like, they're telling you about the worst day of their life. And that's not just in sexual assault cases, that's in most of the stories I write about. You know, whether or not they're, they're being sexually abused or emotionally abused or, or were defrauded or were scammed or in, you know, some, Something bad happened to them, otherwise they're generally not the subject of the story. They're telling you about something deeply personal that has affected them, and nine times out of ten is probably the worst thing that's ever happened to them. They're telling a complete stranger. And then you feel, I feel, this sense of, you know, ownership. Like, okay, I now have this thing that you just gave me and I need to do the right thing with it. So I need to go now tell this story. I need to tell it correctly, in the right context. I need to do it justice. You feel this stewardship over a big piece of this person that you just talked to. And these things keep me up at night. I mean, I, I, no joke, there are stories that die sometimes and like I still wake up <laughs> sometimes in the middle of the night and I'm like, oh my God, we never did that story about that person, you know, because it really, it's, it's a heavy it's, it's a heavy thing. I don't take it lightly and I and I that's what I don't see myself as it's not whether or not I have the strength to do it. It's more about they have the strength to tell me and now I gotta help them get that out there. That's two, how I put two it. more questions, folks, and then we go to wine and cheese. Go ahead. Oh, I, I have two questions. Um, 
first I was going to ask about how you think this would have played differently had social media looked six years ago, how it looks today with just the proliferation of it, disinformation, misinformation, fake news, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then another question was related to the investigative piece that this woman asked around, how do you tell the difference but when something is a story? Is it gut instinct? Like, did the guy with the story at the VA hospital in Arizona have, yeah. what is the instinctual part that this is gonna go from maybe an isolated incident to, to, to something larger? How, how does that work? As Sometimes you really don't know, I'll start with that one. Sometimes I think you really don't know. Like I did not, I recognized that pedophilia was a crime, but I did not recognize that Jerry Sandusky's arrest was going to be a life changing event. Um, sometimes you don't, you don't know. Um, but yeah, the more you write these stories, the more you do them, and the more you, you surround yourself, you're not, in, I'm not isolated. I have a lot of people around me. Some of them have been doing this three times as long as I have, four times as long as I have, and you have a boss, you know, you have people who sort of guide you in the direction, but a lot of it is, for me, I think gut instinct. I hear someone talk and, you know, you have the context of hearing dozens of other people's stories and you sort of know when something is wrong and someone has been wronged. And it's human nature, you know, if I tell you a story right now, you'll probably understand it too, if it's right or wrong. Um, or if it needs to be told. One of the things that I've always wondered is like, if I sit down and I tell my dad this, and my dad so is uh, in pest control, so not in journalism. <laughs> it might, if I sit down and tell my dad this, like, will he care? And if he doesn't, then, you know, maybe it's a little too in the weeds. <laughs> and part of that is, how well can I tell him the story? Because, you know, you can, you can tell a story badly. And, and it could be still really important. But, um, you know, do everyday people, like moms who are dropping their kids off at the carpool line, and, and pharmacists, and doctors, and teachers, and, and all, you know, people in other walks of life, not just government, not just journalism, do they, are they affected by this? And do they care about it? And um, so that's a good way to gauge. What was your other question? I'm sorry. So, social media and how it's oh. changed and what it's yeah. like. I mean, to answer that question, really, all you need to do is go home and Google it now, Joe Paterno's name, and you'll see that um, there are people out there who have, you know, taken that fake news to this, you know, to this story retroactively, and they're trying really hard to, to create a new narrative out of it. Um, you know, there are people out there who are fighting right now for the innocence of Jerry Sandusky, even though he was convicted by a jury on 10 counts and, you know, um, has lost all, all of his appeals for six years. And they still are trying to figure out how, you know, and these are not, I'm not talking about his lawyers, you know, I'm talking about people who don't know him, <laughs> who have made this their new job to try to prove the, on the internet that he was not really a pedophile. Ambassador Gabriel? Uh, yeah, um, I really have found tonight fascinating and um, I love the format. Uh, you both have done a great job and I have to thank Peter and Ann for making series like this work because uh, if we find the time to come to them we can learn so much. I mean Sarah, you've been great. We've learned a lot from you tonight. Um, and you make me think about the fact that I'm the uh, chairman of two American schools in Morocco. And I'm, all of a sudden I'm thinking to myself, am I on top of these issues? Are we doing best practices? So you, you affect people by your conversation. Um, thank you. Uh, my question would be, I mean, you've done a lot in a short period of time in your life. Um, where do you want to go next? What do you want to do? Are well, you just going to continue to push? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just sorry. Oh, well, you, there's a good dinner. Had <laughs> no, that's true. Um, so the question is, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Oh, no, I hate that question. <laughs> ah, it's my least favorite question. I <laughs> cannot plan Thank that far ahead. I cannot plan, <laughs> I can't plan that far. And I so? couldn't, like, when I was in college and, and the, the counselors would ask, where do you see yourself in five years? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and by the way, if I had guessed, I would not have guessed correctly because like here we are and this was not something I could have guessed.
So I really try not to do that because I think it's kind of a waste of time. You know, things happen that are, I mean, this happened to me. I, I do think I was prepared for it and I, I had good sources and I worked really hard in my little small town newspaper when I was the half reporter of four and a half reporters making, you know, nothing, $22,000 a year. I worked really hard and I prepared for, you know, I wanted to be a good journalist and then when this story happened I was prepared for it. But this story happened to me, like, you know, I could have been a tiny small town reporter in Omaha and then I would probably still be a tiny small reporter in Omaha. So this happened to be in the place that I was. So I sort of, I like what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. Television is a different way of telling stories, for sure. So it's a challenge. And now Which I'm do you still... prefer? You know, it's interesting because my heart probably is always with print. print. But that said, television is a very powerful medium. You can, I cannot write the best story I've ever written in my life. It's never going to have the same impact on you as a story that you watch where you see the person who actually went through this thing telling you this, you know, talking to you and telling the story. No, n no writer can duplicate that. So television is, is a very, it has a far reach and it's very powerful, but it's different. The business model is different, you know, like in print, I would find a story and I would pitch it to my boss and they would say, write it. So I'd sit there and make 10 phone calls and then I would write it and then the next day it was on the newsstands. In t TV, you find a person, you say, I have this great story, and they say, how much is it going to cost? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's going to cost $10,000 for me, two cameras, 18 pieces of luggage, to all get on a flight, fly to Colorado, stay in a hotel for two nights, shoot this interview, lighting, you know, I have to make sure I look okay, I can't just like wear whatever I want, and I have to put makeup on it, it's like, their hair out of place, you go back and your boss is like, your hair looks terrible. Like, did you hear what I said? <laughs> like, your hair looks terrible. I mean, like, it's a different thing. It's different. It's completely different. And so, yeah, I had to learn, like, all that stuff first, and then go back to the reporting. Uh, uh, Sorry, Sarah, I'm not talking too long. If you didn't get a chance to ask a question, uh, Sarah's going to be around for a bit, and we can do it over wine. Uh, let, me, um, let me ask you one last question, yes. though. Uh, are you the youngest person to ever win a Pulitzer Prize no. journalism? You're not? I am not. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I decided that wasn't the case. That's why I did uh, so what, what the, so There were two others who were younger than me, oh, really? and they were both women. <laughs> hey. uh, one last thing, folks. Just a second. Uh, I want to give a plug. You're, you're at the Georgetown Library. Uh, some of you, but not all, are undoubtedly members of the Library Associates. Mm -hmm. It's a great program. Uh, ask uh, Emily or, or, or Peggy about it. Uh, if you're not a member, sign up and you'll get to go to a lot of great events. Well, maybe not as good as this, but you'll get to go to a lot. <laughs> maybe you'll, you'll get to go to an awful lot of uh, great events. Uh, let's once again thank Sarah for being here and let's uh, join her outside. <laughs>